Well, good morning, New Life. We're out here enjoying again a wonderful time of worship together out here in beautiful McGinnis Park that God has provided. If any of you are on Facebook and following Wendell City, there was a really nice article that they posted about this very park and how it came into being and the importance of the baseballs, diamonds, and stuff like that. It's a great spot for gathering for sure. And we are here as the church today to redeem this space to the glory of God. We're looking at a series of messages right now called A Lively Look at the Seven Deadly Sins. And uh, sin is not one of those great subjects everybody likes to talk about. But one of the things we do here at New Life is we do talk about sin, open and honestly, because we recognize that when we see according to God's word that we're prone, our hearts are prone to drift from God and choose our own way. And he gives us guidance in his word, even as simply as the Ten Commandments, of what is the honorable way to go, what is going to give us fruitfulness and, uh, and fulfillment in life. But we often choose to go our own way. And when we recognize that sin in our own life, as well as communal sin, that we really get to grab a hold of grace a lot more. We really understand the real sacrifice Christ made for us. And so let, one of the things we celebrate here is walking by the Spirit, that the Spirit is in the business of transforming us so that we sin less, right? And that we give God the glory. Today we're talking about an interesting topic for being out here, the sin of gluttony. And when you think about gluttony, you have a lot of different understandings of what that might be. And I think a lot of people misunderstand gluttony. They think, that well, that means you eat too much and you're overweight. Uh, no, we're going to dig down on this and you're going to discover, as I did, I'm guilty of gluttony. And it's kind of subtle in a way that you don't always see it. So let me give you a definition. Gluttony is the excessive desire for the pleasure of eating and drinking or for food over worship. It's food worship. In other words, if you follow me on Facebook, you know I just was at the Cajun pot this week and I had to post pictures of my great uh, Cajun uh, hamburger. It was delicious, right? I can be guilty of food worship. I post that stuff. People say, boy, Gary, if I watch, follow your Facebook, that's what I see, fishing and food. <laughs> So as we unpack this a little bit, we're actually going to get to Philippians chapter 3. It's going to be a little bit. i got a couple other verses I want to share with you before we get there. If you have your Bibles, open it up to Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to get to verses 17 through 21. First of all, we have to recognize that many of these uh, deadly sins that we recognize can be God-encouraged as well. And what happens is we take them and run them amok. And gluttony is one of those. God has given us a desire for food. He's given us a desire to eat on a regular basis. You ever wonder why you don't just eat once a day? No, we generally eat three times with some snacks in between, right? It's a regular rhythm of our life that we get hungry. And I think God put that in there as a way to remind us to be praying to him. And one of the things people will sometimes do is have a prayer before they eat, no matter where they are. And I encourage you, if you're not in that practice... It's a good discipline to get into. But as we start this idea, one of the things of Proverbs and this desire, it says this in Proverbs chapter 23, verses 1 to 3. Listen to this. When you sit to dine with a ruler, note well what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you are given to gluttony. Do not crave his delicacies. For that food is deceptive. When I read that proverb, I was like, wait, well, let's put a knife to your throat if you're guilty of gluttony. So pretty serious, according to the writer of Proverbs. What is going on here? Well, what Proverbs is written to a son. A father, listen to the wisdom of, of what I'm teaching you and what I'm training you. And he's called to restrain his appetite, to see the deception of food and to discern the truth. And we are so marketed today when it comes to food, aren't we? I mean, it's so easy for food to become a worship point. And so what I want to talk to you is about your eating habits. If you're following on the outline on the back or those of you listening online, when you get to see our regular email comes out with our outline, the first thing is eating habits. And when you make gluttony a habit, our stomachs 
become our idols or our our God. And we let eating, its comfort, its pleasure, its fullness to rule our lives. But let's ask this question. What does gluttony look like? One of the resources I've given to our leadership team is a, a study by Rebecca DeYoung for high school students on the seven deadly sins. And she talks in her lesson guide about five forms of gluttony, of gluttony, I'm sorry, gluten, gluten, five forms of gluttony. And as I go through these, I want you to think, do any of these sound familiar for you? The two categories are accept this desire for pleasure expressed in what is eating, okay, what you're eating. And the second set is about how it's eaten. So listen to these. What is eaten? Too fussingly. Caring too much about how it's prepared. Just the way I like it. Second, too richly. Only the best, richest, or most satisfying foods. Again, we're talking about what is eaten. And then, three, too much. You know, we got a potluck today, so think about these things when you're talking through that serving line here today as well, right? When you're looking at all those things, what is being eaten, what I'm going to choose, what I'm not going to choose. Oh, that looks really good. I want that. Oh, what happened here? You know, so think about these things, how quickly and easily. The second set, two of them, excessive desire for pleasure expressed how it's eaten too soon, too hastily. Ignoring the proper time or pace for eating. And you do that, eat too fast, right? Sometimes joke. How about number five, too greedily. Ignoring the proper manners of eating. Well, that's interesting. So those are some thoughts to carry with you as we have our butt luck here a little bit later. But how do we overcome gluttony? That's the second thing that we're talking about here today, the second blank on your outline. And Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 6. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. So think about that in your own life. What are the things that tend to trip you up? What are the things that tend to master you. And of course, here we're talking about overcoming gluttony, some of these attitudes, some of these eating habits we can really take a look at because our real theme is about the secret of being content. In our Christian walk, it requires that we pay attention. That's been part of this series of the seven deadly sins. Is paying attention, being active, being intentional in what we're doing and how we're living our lives today. And so many times there's false teachings out there. There's false deceptions of ads that are out there just basically trying to really in a big way interrupt your cash flow plan. But at the same time, tantalize you to what is desirable. Have you ever noticed some of the hamburger commercials that you see on TV and then when you go and order it, it looks nothing like that? <laughs> Some people have said that's because the hamburger on TV is not really real. They use other kind of ingredients just to make it look as tantalizing as possible to get you down there to order it. And I'm guilty of that. I've done that. I've, I've gone over to a place and said, man, I saw what was on TV. I saw the ad or I saw, and man, I've been craving it for two weeks. Give me that. And then I'm oftentimes very disappointed. So as we look at this idea about overcoming gluttony, we look at Philippians chapter 3, because Paul explains the Christian life must be lived in accordance to an established standard. So here at New Life, you all look very comfortable in these particular chairs you're in today. But we like to stand in honor of God's word when it's read publicly. And so I invite you to join me as we listen to Paul explain how the Christian life should be lived each and every day. Philippians 3, verses 17 through 21. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. 
and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ. Who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control. Will transform our lowly bodies. So that they will be like his glorious body. This is the word of the Lord. Go ahead and have a seat. Paul says it very clear there in verse 17. Take note and live according to the pattern we gave you. Follow my example. Can you say that? Oftentimes parents end up setting the example for their kids. And sometimes we're surprised at what they pick up. Right? Like, why does why do our children pick up no so fast? And thank you seems to be such a struggle. <laughs> right? It's It's crazy. But for us, Paul is saying that, follow my example. And so these words apply to all of us as as Christians today. I mean, we can be vulnerable to the latest trends that are out there. Even in our thinking, we can grab a hold of some of these ideas. They sound good. They they present a valuable or a, a distinguished argument. But yet, in reality, it's often false, according to God's truth that's revealed in his word. And that's where we need to find it. So when we think about this idea of gluttony, the whole idea of pursuing and desiring food in a way that, like the Paul says there, is that God is their stomach, that that's my driving force, we miss God himself. And so the secret of contentment is found in Christ, in Christ alone. And I think throughout this series, we've been hearing that over and over and over again, that in these deadly sins, what it is is we're choosing an alternative to the greatest blessing we have, and that is salvation through Christ alone, through faith alone, to the glory of God alone. One of the uh, readings we've been reading is uh, called Killjoys, and I'd like to read a quote for you from it. Gluttony, like all sin, distorts the purpose of God's good creation. Food was never meant to be an end in itself. It's a means of receiving needed nourishment, and a sign pointing us to our need for God. The rhythm of hunger and satisfaction we experience in our stomach is a dramatization of the relationship between God and our very existence. This is the point of God's word to Israel in Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. By treating food as an end in itself, gluttony ruins our appetite for fellowship with our Creator. It exchanges the glory of the immortal God for a ham sandwich and kettle chips. Have you ever thought of that? I mean, I had never thought of that. That going after food and holding it up at such high value that I'm actually exchanging something, a rhythm, a pattern that God has given me to turn me to him and to be reminded of my relationship for him. Does that mean I'm not going to be posting any more pictures of uh, of the Cajun pot, Dustin? (laughs) No, I still will. But here's some disciplines that I think we can pick up from from our text. Uh, First, the first discipline is what is going on up here? What is my thinking? He says, their mind is on earthly things there in verses 18 and 19. And so when I'm thinking about different things in my life, where is my mind? You know, there's there's a difference between controlling or suppressing your appetite or suppressing your natural tendencies towards self-centeredness. Some of us, they call it white knuckling in recovery. You're trying so hard. I need to do better. I need to be more loving. I need to be more patient. And it's all of this. But instead, what God offers us is a transformation through the power of the Holy Spirit by saying to God, I can't do it. I desire to change this. And I know that you're the only one who can do it for me. And so by your spirit, come in and radically transform my personal selfish desires to ones that will glorify you. And I put it to death. I take captive every thought and turn it over to Christ. Amen. That change that thinking. Don't allow stinking thinking to interrupt what God is doing in your life when you focus in on your own self and how you see it and how you think it should be. 
You can be right in the middle of something amazing that God is doing and you miss it because you're focused on your own thoughts. God says, my ways are not your ways. And so God, show me in the midst of this. We sang it in our songs today. Beginning and end, I trust in the faithfulness of God. I don't know what tomorrow will bring, but this one thing I do know is God is still on the throne. So we have to change our thinking in the area of gluttony. Then I think also thinking. The second thing I think of discipline is to be thankful. No matter what's put in front of you, (laughs) be thankful. You ever been in a restaurant and you watch and most people get their food and they just start eating? Not us as Christ followers. We pray. Because we're thankful. We're thankful for what God has given our community to be able to store up food. I mean, we're, we're incredibly blessed here, aren't we? I'm so thankful there are organizations that take some of the fruit and some of the harvest and the products where we turn our nose up because it's not top quality and would often easily just discard it or disc it back into the fields. And they provide it for those of a lesser income that are food in need of food. Our standards are so high. And so we give thanks to God. And and how do we do that? Well, Paul says, don't forget where your citizenship is. This body is wasting away. It's going to be gone. You have a citizenship in heaven. Now, some have said, are we going to eat in heaven? Well, I don't know. Jesus, when he was resurrected, he ate. He even gave some to the disciples. He was a good cook. He cooked it well, that fish on the beach. But we need to remember our citizenship is not here. We are destined to another place. It's in heaven, and we eagerly await our Savior for there. Listen, God didn't make our world to be filled with sorrow and pain and death and violence and suffering. He has a plan. He has a plan to renew it. That's the reason Jesus came. To restore things for the better. And then, not only that, but he sends his church on mission to do just that. And so whether it's through food banks or whether it's through different other ministry opportunities that we have where we could join others. He's enabled us as his church to go together and bring healing in the lives of other people around us. In many different ways. Both physically, emotionally, mentally, and ultimately spiritually. You're thinking, you're thinking, and the last discipline is loving God. And I think that's what Paul is telling us here. If you love anything more than God, if you live for anything more than God, your life is going to be restless, and you're going to be discontent. Because that's what we're talking about here, ultimately, is contentment. Remember that Christ has atoned for sin, including the sin of gluttony given us a spirit of self-control. Christ is the very embodiment of self-control. Do you know they called him a glutton and a drunkard because of who he ate food with? That was a characteristic. And the proverb says you should put a knife to your throat. Wow, those are harsh words. You probably didn't never pick that up before of how Christ was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. Well, he took the reproach of the sinner's table so that we could all come and might know the joy of the Lord's table. In fact, in a couple of weeks, we'll be celebrating, Lord willing, at New Life, that communion table where Christ welcomes us all. He's cleansed us of our disordered cravings, and in him we have the crucified flesh with his passions and desires And Christ has sent his spirit to fill us up and to bear the fruit of self-control. Eric Raymond, in his book, Chasing Contentment, says this. As believers, we continue to learn contentment by learning to trust and treasure God in every situation. God has provided us with the Bible and the church to be the means by which we work this out in our lives. 
As believers, we draw near to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in times of need. This help is never less than recalibrating our hearts and minds to the truth of the gospel. We ask God to make us content in him and to help us see through the shiny wrappers around us. We have who we need. We have what we need. And we are going to where we need to go. Therefore, we plead with God that we might truly trust and treasure Jesus Christ. Well, at minimum, I hope today has at least pricked your mind or your thoughts about how often you think about food. And many times people will set aside fasting, stepping away from food, just to discipline themselves to focus on where they're at. That might be something you might consider this week. Not today. We have a potluck. Don't start today. I'm fasting. But take some time this week and maybe skip a meal just so you can focus in on God. Our next message series is Christian Disciplines, and one of those disciplines is fasting. And so we'll go further and deeper into that spiritual practice. Maybe give up soda this week. Maybe sugar or snacks as a life experiment, and then talk about it. Talk about it with somebody else. You know, I gave up sugar. If you ever look at the list of ingredients, it's crazy. Even the little snacks for kids going to school right now, don't pick up those sugary ones. Look on the back. Some of them have 12 grams of sugar per serving. That's like three teaspoons. Too, it's too much. Anyway, take a look at fasting. But then also set aside some occasional times for feasting. You know, throughout the Old Testament, we see again and again, God was gracious in providing and had a celebratory feast. Even Paul said that he had learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So let us feel such a satisfaction in our union with Christ that we can skip lunch on Tuesday, but have the opportunity to go back for seconds today. <laughs> or potluck. Finally, always give thanks to God before you enjoy your meal. Let's do that together. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we've gone through this series, that you would continue to strengthen within us the virtues of the Christian life. Let our mindset be of patience, of kindness, 